Lindholm stay, is his name, isn't it? Yeah, Bruce Willis films, right? They see that in The Terminator, they see that in all these kind of action films, they see the same kind of destruction. They are not kind of, these images are not new to them. They see it still. So when, it, when they see it in that context, what's it for? Entertainment. How can they transcend? Is there even a process of transcending? Could they really transcend from what they're so accustomed and used to in seeing on the visual media from an entertainment perspective in a Hollywood film to something like that in real life? Real life destruction, right? And that again, of course, complicates the whole idea of the image. Right? We really, Muslims, should be, uh, we should really look for the nuances, man. We should really search, you know, what human empathy is. I'll give an example. I read a lot about human suffering. You know, I read the diary of Anne Frank. I have another one of a girl called Alicia, who was also a victim of the Holocaust, right? I've just finished reading the autobiography of Natasha Kampusch, eight-year-old girl who was kidnapped by an Austrian man. Wolfgang Pricklepill, she was kidnapped for, 18, for eight or nine years. She escaped when she was 18. Then, then the kidnapper threw himself in front of a train. Right? It's a story of kidnap. It's a story of enslavement. It's a story of, you know, what you might call torture. Right? Because you have to connect. But of course, we have so many of those from the side of the Muslims. You know, we have equally disturbing stories of brutalization, of inhumanity. Right now in America, for example, and here's one for you to remember, you have, of course, the, the, the death squads in America, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and the videos are released, right? And I don't know if you guys, if you saw that clip from Donald, Donald Rumsfeld, um, where he was asked by someone, and this was on record, it's recorded, and he says, well, it's far worse than Abu Ghraib. It's far worse than the the evil acts of humiliation that they perpetrated against Muslims in Abu Ghraib, right? Or all the evil things that they did, and they took pictures, and again, it's entertainment. You can see, can you see the entertainment purpose behind it for them, right? You have new ones now, right? And I've seen a few of them. The innocent, the complete indiscriminate killing of Muslims in Afghanistan, and it's for fun. They have rock music playing in the background. Right? They're egging the other helicopters on, you take the shot first, or I'll take the shot first. You know? They have another one, which I've seen, of two Muslims on a, in a, on a bicycle who are ambushed by these soldiers, in America, American soldiers, and they're killed. One of them has a camera. He's taking the camera and he's saying to the other guys, let me check out his shoes. Right? Because he's wearing sandals, he's a poor man. Let me check out his shoes. The other one says, have you got it on camera? Right? Other one says, let me go and check out my kill. Right? And that video is passed around the other uh, members of the American military, right, for entertainment purposes. Right? So where is, the, where is the connection? We might speak about the Holocaust, and I might tell you about how Hitler disconnected people, how he dehumanized people, but you see the same process of dehumanization and depersonalization today with another people who are the other, in Arabic we call the Akhar, the other people, right? They're nameless. That's why in Guantanamo Bay they don't have names, they have numbers. In the Holocaust no one had names, they only had numbers. Because the moment you give someone a number, you depersonalize him. He's simply an item, like a cargo, like they were in the Holocaust. So we can see these connections. And they all have an end time relevance in light of this hadith, of course, and in light of, of others. The important thing is, my dear brothers, about the time that we live in, and what I really think is important for us to understand is the whole, the whole problem with the image, the whole problem with celebrity culture, right, and how it's affecting and how it does affect Muslims today. You know, we have crimes, we have crimes of envy. Why do we have crimes of envy when we have so much instruction from our Prophet the famous hadith Qudsi, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ibadi inni haramtu ghulma ala nafsi wa ja'altu baynakum muharraman fala tawalamu. This hadith, kana Abu Idris al-Khawlani, idha haddatha bihad al-hadith, ya ta'ala rakbatayn. If he would narrate this hadith, he would kneel on the floor out of respect 
for the greatness of this hadith, it begins by speaking about injustice, zulm. What is our connection with injustice? Because one of the things before the end of time, the increase in zulm, the increase in injustice. The Prophet said, "Ittaqul zulm, fa'inna zulm zulmat yom qiyamah." Beware of injustice, because that is darkness on the day of judgment. One of the great signs before the end of time, of course, is the emergence of the Dajjal. Right? He is called the Dajjal by the by explanation of the grammarians, right? Like in the Sana Arab, because he can confound the truth with bug with error. Right? He confounds, he mixes and fuses the truth with error. And for that reason he's he's is called Dajjal. But of course, some of the things that the Jal will do are established on an illusion. For example, the hadith it says, the Jal wa al yusra, ma'ahu janna wa nar, wa nar wa janna wa janna wa nar, wa kama qal. He is blind in his left eye, and he has a river, he has a paradise, and he has a fire. And the fire is paradise, and the, par and the paradise is the fire. And the Prophet said, if you ever see that situation, throw yourselves in the fire, right? Because the fire will be the paradise. That is an illusion then. What he presents people is illusory. It is not as it seems to be. When that man, that boy comes, he's a young boy, right? And he will come and he will say to the uh, gods of the Dajjal, uh, I want to see the man, the Dajjal, and they will refuse him. And he will convince them. Then they will allow him. And he will go in the court of the Dajjal, and he will say, "Ashhadu anka Dajjal, aladhi haddathna tu zalam ank." Or kama qal, "I testify that you are the Dajjal which our Prophet told us about concerning you." The Dajjal says to his people, "Araitum in qatil tu hada." Do you see if I kill this man? At the shukun fil amr, would you doubt me? Would you doubt the affair if I kill this boy? Then ahiyatu. Then I bring him back to life. If I could kill this man and bring him back to life, will you doubt in me? Of course, they will worship him, right? As a god, as a prophet and as a god, right? And they say, no, we, don't, we will never doubt you if you could do that. Then he will do that. Then he will kill him, then he will bring him back to life. When the boy comes back to life, the boy will say, uh, now I, I believe even more that you are the Dajjal, right? Because of what our prophet said concerning this incident. The hadith it says the Dajjal will throw him, fling him, and the people will think that he's been thrown in the fire, but he's been thrown into paradise, and he is the best of the martyrs. That means it's an illusion. It isn't as it seems to be. What are we being offered today except an illusion? It isn't as it seems to be, right? We are promised things, but in reality, the uh, essence of how finite, how, how transitory they are sometimes escapes our minds, we should realize the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these things that are here are simply here only for a short while and they will not be here for long. The other thing that we could understand from these kind of pictures is the illusion of war. The illusion of war. What do we mean by the illusion of war? How does that connect to the time that we're living in towards the end of time? You know in the Battle of Iwo Jima, have you guys heard of the Battle of Iwo Jima? Right? Right? In the Second World War, wasn't it? The Second World War, I think. Oh, sorry? Japan, yeah. Okay, Iwo Jima. The U.S. Marines who went to fight in Iwo Jima, uh, there is, of course, a gross deception in that famous iconic picture that you have of those American soldiers laying the flag. Have you guys seen that? All right? And it's so iconic, it's like the beginning, beginning of movies and the beginning of this and that, right? It's iconic. There is an irony about this picture if you guys study. Because uh, when the guy took this photograph, the photographer, right after that picture, there was chaos. A few of the people were killed, by the way, in that scene, right? They were killed. But the picture remains so iconic, right? And one of the people who was the hero was a Native American like an Indian, basically, who drank himself to death. Why did he drink himself to death? And you can, there's a song that was composed about him, by the way, as well. Um, he drank himself to death because of the deceit of celebrity culture. After the Battle of Iwo Jima, the, those Marines who were injured were in Hawaii. They were stationed in Hawaii, in the hospital in Hawaii, and they were injured. Uh, 
This famous movie actor, John Wayne, right, went to visit them. He was a very famous American movie actor. He went to visit them. But when he went to visit them, he was wearing a, a cowboy outfit, right, with a pistol, right? And he was booed, and he was snared, and he was hissed, right? Imagine the scene, right? Like, you know, you have some celebrities go and visit the injured people, right? Yeah, John Wayne starred in a movie about the Battle of Iwo Jima. Right? The man made millions because of the movie. Here these injured marines, of course, have lost their arms and legs, have no notoriety and fame. Right? They, don't, they can't transcend into the realm of celebrity status right? because they don't have it. This person is sucking the money out of their sacrifice, from their perspective. Right? This is why they booed him and they hissed him. That is the deceit and the illusion of war right? and of celebrity officer. People don't know, of course. Right? That on average, every single year from 2004, from my record, uh, around 250 to 300 American soldiers killed themselves. Right? This post-war. They attribute this, of course, to a post-war syndrome, like the Gulf War syndrome. But that's every single year, between 250 to 300 American soldiers killed themselves. But who's going to speak about that? Right? Because it looks bad, of course, for, for their propaganda purposes, isn't it? Understand? That's the idea. So we have this illusion of war. The point is this, the war is unethical, right? The war is established on lies, the war is established on deceit, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes it for what it really is, right? It's an invasion into other people's lands, right? It's a denying of those people their basic human rights, right? It's coming with slaughter, it's coming with sexual abuse, it's coming with house raids, it's coming with imprisonment, it's coming with all these kind of things, and at the end they are exposed for the liars that they are. One of the signs before the end of time, the Prophet said, Inna dajaluna kadhabun yatunakum min al-ahadith bima lam tasma'u antum wa la'abaukum fa'iyakum wa iyaahum la yudhalunakum wa la yudhalunakum wa kama qal he says, indeed, before, to, before the end of time, there will be uh, Dajjals, there will be imposters and liars, right? And they will come to you with new talk that neither you've heard before, nor your fathers ever heard before, right? You've never heard that talk before, neither your fathers ever heard that talk before. Meaning new claims about Islam, new things about Islam. And they should not misguide you. They should not be a trial for you. You should be aware of them and your father should be aware of them also. Beware therefore, before the end of time, there shall be new people emerging and they will present a new kind of Islam. And this of course is happening very much now. The neocon, neocon policies in America stipulate this. One of their agendas of course is to give precedence and prominence to some small factions of Islam, giving them air time, giving them uh, the rights for publication, giving them money, giving them centers, and pushing that call up. The one that agrees with American interests and particularly American foreign policy. Right? Whereas those who object, right? whereas those who claim, well, our religion is against all of this, and our religion has its own you know, ethical framework. Remember, we are not a people of destruction. Nabi Sallallahu he didn't come to destroy. We speak of jihad, we speak about liberation, we speak about removing the ghulam, removing the injustice and placing the justice. Who knows, for example, that in this, at one narration from Ali ibn Abi Talib, he found a note in the hilt of the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that note had three pieces of advice. Awalan, the first one, Sulman Tata'ak, wa ahsan ila man asana ilayk, Join relations with those who break them off with you and show goodness to those who show evil to you and speak the truth even if it's against your own selves. That is the ethical framework, framework of principle around which we engage with others. It isn't a, a needless obliteration. You saw those images in that time in 2008 where you had those small Israeli girls who are writing messages on the bombs, right? Like, you know, you know, have fun from whatever name, right? This is our message to you, right? You've seen those pictures. Imagine that. What a kind of grotesque thing to do. Here you have small child children who are writing messages of hate, right, on bombs that are going to kill people. You have completely eroded 
the whole idea of human suffering, complete look, mass, lack and loss of human affinity towards the other. Right? We are not, the Prophet said, do not even destroy trees in your engagement. Why? What is it in trees that is so specific? Do not kill people who are asleep. What is it so specific in people who are asleep? Do not kill women and children. What is so specific in all of these things? Do not even destroy, uproot nature. Don't even uproot nature. You have no business to do that. Do not even cut down trees. Don't uproot nature. Nature is aesthetic. Nature is beautiful even to see. Nature provides us with warmth. Nature provides us with comfort. We like the landscape. We like the greenery. We like the trees. Don't even destroy that. That tree has done no harm to you. That tree does not deserve to be uprooted and cut down. The man who is asleep, the pen is lifted from him. What is your business to kill him? And women and children provide the fabric of our society. They provide the harmony and the love and the peace of our generation, of our society. Imagine a society when women and children don't exist. You will have brutes, right? It's true. You will have brutes. Right, who will run and trample on this earth with aggression and a heavy handedness. Do they provide our comfort? Think about these principles, these ethical framework of our Prophet, divine uh, inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him, sallallahu Right? That is what our religion stands for. This is what they stand for. Needless obliteration of the others with no sense of principle. Right? And in the middle of that, there's accounts of rape. And it's accounts of burning human beings alive and then raping them and then digging graves for them and then setting fires to their homes and slaughtering their families because of aggression, because of revenge. SubhanAllah, read what our religion says about warfare, right? Read what our religion says about these things and then you will see and you can compare. So we are not either those who have this gangster persona of needless, mindless, Killing for the sake of killing or to be seen and respected in your society, that is not respect. You know what's strange about the time that we're living in, and this is also a process of inversion, is that now goodness has become weakness. Right? The more the, the kind of the more loud you are, right? The louder you are, this definitely affects our sisters, it also affects us. Right? This is maybe a problem of rise of feminism, I don't know. I'm not gonna make any claims without knowledge. But you know you have this. The louder you are, the stronger, the more respected you are, right? The more, the more the, you can swear, right? The more people don't mess with you, isn't it? Yeah. The more respect you have, the kind of the more you can bully people around, the more respect you will have, right? The more people will respect you, right? Whereas in our religion, the Prophet said, you know, listen, that this is this is not strength, right? The strong one is not the one who can quickly get angry. The strong one is the one who can control his anger in a moment of rage. That is the strong one. The one who can control and suppress his nafs and his ego and his anger in a moment and time of rage. That is the strong one. The strong one is the one who can say, you know what, I'm sorry even though he hasn't made a mistake. I guarantee a house on the outskirts of Jannah for the one who can leave an argument even though he knows he's correct. Right? And the hadith ends by saying, and is the reason he in Jannah, a house in the middle of the highest part of Jannah for the one who can have a good character, a good disposition. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those good things of which we speak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the trials and the temptations and the disasters of the age in which we live and these things that are precarious for us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the fitna of the Dajjal. You know, one thing I must end by saying is this, look, it is not so much about knowing all of the information and the hadith, it is about how do we protect ourselves from these things, right? How do we protect ourselves from them? In one hadith, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا تَشَهَدْ أَحَدَكُمْ فَلِسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ أَرْبَعَةً When one of you makes the shahud in his salah, he's sitting down position in his salah, he should seek refuge with Allah from four things. Right? أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ 
right? Allahu min adhabu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnat al-mahiyah wa al-mamat wa min shara fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. I seek refuge with you, O Allah, from the punishment of hell and from the punishment of the grave and from the trial of life and death and from the trial, from the evil of the trial of the Antichrist from the Dajjal. He also said whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, Surah 18, all the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, he is protected from the Dajjal after the Dajjal comes in his time. So we should learn these things. When the man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Asa'a, when is the last hour? Right? Like people ask, isn't it? When is the last hour going to be? The Prophet replied to him, What have you prepared for? Right? Isn't that more pertinent than simply knowing when the last hour is? What have you prepared for it? The hadith continues, of course, the man in his modesty says, I prepared la shade, nothing for it. Illa, except I love Allah and His Prophet Right? This is modesty. Of course, a man is a, a very strong believer. He prays five times a day. The basic requirement.